Bonjour, welcome back to the Ephemeris Podcast. I don't know why I started with a French greeting, but um, no matter uh, what greeting I start with, I'm always your host, Aphelion. And as I promised, there is a double episode this week. And as we all know, we've dipped our toes into Greek astronomy, so it is time to get knees deep. And I want to start out with Philolos and sort of the I th- uh, sort of the essence of Pythagoreanism because I think it contains interesting themes that I'd like to discuss and um, we're going to get into that just very shortly. So without further ado, let's talk about Philolos first. I just want to give some context as to who he is before we get into his theories and his subscription to the ideas of Pythagoreanism and what that entails. So, Philolos, he's around during the 4th and early 3rd century BCE. He was likely born in Croton in southern Italy, and he's described as not only a pre-Socratic philosopher, but also a contemporary of Socrates, and that might sound unintentionally contradictory, but um, pre-Socratic philosopher basically just means that um, anybody who's a pre-Socratic philosopher just studied the idea of the first cause of the universe. And a contemporary of Socrates would mean that he lived during the time of Socrates. So it sounds unintentionally contradictory, but it really isn't. So back to his whole life story. Um, Philolos, during his lifetime, uh, fled to Greece and then came back to southern Italy I think he did a lot of uh, teaching during his time in Greece and in Italy, but um, the facts around his life obviously tend to be speculative because of how old this, um, uh, kind of how long ago he lived. And also another speculative thing about his life is that he was apparently executed due to suspicions of treason. And this is also a questionable claim that was made by I think you pronounce the name Laertius? Laertius? I don't know. It's a very um, confusing name. But yeah, this guy, um, he made some dubious claims. Let's just say that. So we can't really trust him when he tells us this information about Philolos being executed due to suspicions of treason. So yeah. Um, He was said to have taught other Greek philosophers like Simeus, Sebes, and... um, I'm really trying to get these names right. They're not too important, but I just like to get them right. Um, Architas, Xenophilus, etc. So yeah, just just a bunch of random names that aren't going to be too significant. I just kind of put that in my notes. And um, yeah, so this is a great place to just transition into his theories because his life we don't know much about, but his ideas we sort of do. So let's begin with some of his basic uh, metaphysics that he developed. So Philolos believed a principle of odds and evens and limiteds and unlimiteds. Before we dive deep into this idea, though, I do want to preface it by mentioning some of the basic values that um, were contained in Pythagoreanism and basic values that Pythagoreans held. So and this is because um, all of Philolos' theories are going to have something to do with uh, the ideals of Pythagoreanism. So I briefly touched on Pythagoreans in the last episode. Um, Basically, what you need to know is Pythagoreans is just a general group that I think Aristotle tends to refer to and Plato tends to refer to quite often. And these group of peoples, or these group of people, Uh, believed numbers have everything to do with the universe, and they tried to incorporate arithmetic and numerology into cosmology. And they also developed the concept of harmony using music and numbers, but that's mainly going to be under Philolos' name, which we're going to talk about in just a moment. So, Philolos was a subscriber of Pythagoreanism, obviously. So, back to the idea of odds and evens, unlimiteds, and limiteds. Um, He created this idea that all objects in the universe had unlimited nature, but existed in a limited space, or that everything in the universe was basically just a combination of limited and unlimited. 
The reason why he didn't say everything in the universe was unlimited can best be understood when we compare Philolos to Anaxagoras. So um, definitely an important concept to have known beforehand. And if you guys have not seen the episode on Anaxagoras, definitely make sure to go and do that um, if you want to understand the context to the ideas I'm just about to bring up. So we talked about Nous, the mind, and Philolos had a problem with the notion that there are unlimited ingredients to the universe, as we talked about uh, like one or two episodes ago, and an unlimited noose that knows of every occurrence in the universe, like Anaxagoras would claim. And he saw knowledge as a limit and not unlimited, so he really disagreed with the idea of noose. And that's why in the, la um, in the episode on Anaxagoras, when people challenged his idea, really wasn't able to back it up because of things like this. So, yeah, I also appreciate the self-awareness of, you know, knowledge being a limit. Um, however, he doesn't get any more specific in what remains of his work today about unlimited and limited, like what, in what ways, or kind of like what exists that we know of that could be limited or unlimited. He never gave us examples. He didn't really try to explain how unlimited things came about in the universe or explain the origins of limited things. So yeah, that's a lot of unlimited and limited. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much that whole idea there. I'll get into why I mentioned the odds and evens in just a moment. I think the numerology is going to come in in just a moment. So the other fundamental metaphysical concept of his was harmony. And that's going to be the third element of three that he thinks led to the beginning of the universe. So he believed the cosmos came together due to the harmony between the unlimited and the limited. Hence what I just said. He believed that harmony gave cause for the world order, which he literally, I mean, in Greek, it's that's pretty much cosmos spelled with a K and we use cosmos today, right? Um... And yeah, so basically he said harmony was a necessity for order in the universe. And uh, kind of an interesting aspect to the way that he explained harmony, he actually used music. And I promise I'll get back to the cosmology, but I want to look into this a little further. So the story goes that he stated that to create a scale, a musical order, let's call it, you need to you needed to pick a continuum of pitches that contain specific ratios in them. I'm not going to get too specific into the numbers. I just want you to catch the idea. Like, um, for example, I think for you to create a scale, the ratio between the highest pitch to the lowest pitch has to be like two to one in some regards. But yeah, that's besides the point. I just want you to get the idea that he stated that to create a scale or sort of a musical order, you needed to pick a continuum of pitches that contain specific ratios. And the way that Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy describes it, I quite like the way that they describe it. In Philolos' system, the fitting together of limiters and unlimiteds involved their combination in accordance with ratios of numbers. And this sparked an idea in my head. This has to be seriously, seriously advanced. Because think about how many scientific constants we use today that make use of a simple ratio. I'll give you an example. The fine structure constant. I love this constant. It's quite nice. It's a very simple ratio. It's around 1 divided by 137. But it is truly everywhere in physics. It represents a ton of different things, like the energy needed to overcome the electrostatic repulsion between two electrons a distance of d apart, or like the ratio of the velocity of the electron in the first circular orbit of the Bohr model, um, kind of compared to the speed of light in uh, a vacuum, which is just represented by C, the coupling constant, determining the strength of interaction between electrons and photons. It, there, The list goes on. I'm not going to mention all of the things that it represents, but it is truly everywhere in physics. So if in modern science we see scientific constants that describe a significant portion of physics, 
I have a feeling that Philolos was onto something when he was describing cosmological harmony using the ratios in music. I don't know. It's, it's definitely a far fetch, but I, I really, really like this idea. Unfortunately, we don't have evidence that suggests that Philolos ever connected the system he created with his cosmological theories, like in any way, shape, or form. But yeah, I still have that feeling. And what's really cool about this stuff is the that later um, philosophers, philosophers that came after him, got more into it. But yeah, that's that's pretty much all I have for harmony and how he used music and how that might be kind of cool. So let's move on. Another miscellaneous concept that I'll talk about before we talk about um, Philolos' well-known heliocentric kind of model. Um, let's get into the idea of identifying archai. I think that's uh, how you say it. Or the beginnings of any given thing. So basically what this is all about is that Philolos essentially developed a method that consisted of identifying the root causes of any phenomena, like disease or human life. So, for example, with um, the cosmos, he identified three root causes, right? Unlim limited, unlimited, and harmony, right? He did that for things like disease or some other stuff in um, biology-related things. And what I find cool and uh, really important to mention is that uh, Aristotle really adopts this method when he um, uh, when he does his work. So yeah, it's it's kind of nice. It's like you see a cool scientific method pop up, and you're like, you know what? That's worth mentioning. So yeah, all right. Um, the fun bit now. Enough with the unrelated jibber jabber. That was just, you know, that was the build up to the real stuff. So let's get into it. Philolos believed the origin of the cosmos was an interaction between a limiter and an unlimited. Uh, so basically what he believed is some limiter and some unlimited kind of like, I guess, element of the universe came together and it created a central fire. Not the sun, but a central fire in the center of the universe, which goes against the geocentric model, but I do not want to get into that. I want to save that until we get into Aristarchus. Because I don't want to kill the geocentric model before we explain it. Because we, we still have Aristotle, Plato, Ptolemy, all those guys. You know, I don't, I don't want to get too ahead of myself. So, continuing with this theory. The unlimited, based on his theory, must have been the fire that created the central fire. And the limiter must have been some kind of sphere. Um, given this statement, or, you know, if you pull as much evidence from his written work, that's, that's what you'll get to. And in addition to this, apparently time became an extra element being sourced from some kind of void outside of the universe and also became an unlimited along with kind of the, uh, other, other two, I guess, yeah, with the, with the unlimited and the uh, limiter. God, I'm saying unlimited and limited, like, too much. It's actually kind of messing with my head, but let's continue. So, therefore, let's sum up a little. Together, time provides a continuum where the fire from the center of the universe is continually being taken to form celestial objects, which is being allowed by continuous space. Once again, it's kind of nice to know that humans early on had a tendency to believe in the universe being unlimited. That hasn't really changed uh, up until today. And it's especially nice to see that they went about it in a way that was not necessarily kind of seeing the universe as a geocentric model. And this was as early as the 4th century BCE. So yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, Got to take a moment to really think about that. But yeah, anyways, let's continue with the proposed structure of the universe by Phil Loss. He suggested that with this central fire, there were 10 additional objects in the universe and the closest to the central fire was a counter earth. Hmm. So apparently its purpose was to justify the eclipses of the moon and their frequencies and to make the total number of Celestial bodies 10, which Pythagoreans believe was the perfect number. But other than that, I mean, 
there is barely any justification for a counter earth. It could easily just be like 10 objects, including the central fire that are in the universe. But yeah, that's, I guess that's what you get when you're during, when you're there during antiquity. So after the counter earth in order was the earth, then the moon, then the sun, then the five planets that they knew of at the time. And then just fixed stars that are furthest away. And so basically, um, not everything except the stars circled around the central fire. So it was a non-solar universal system, I guess you could call it. And yeah, I mean, that's pretty much the structure that um, Philolos came up with. And his theory about this was a big influence on Aristarchus. Again, I'm going to talk about him once we're done with kind of concluding the foundations of the geocentric model because he's kind of going to break it down. And um, yeah, he's going to revolutionize Greek astronomy. So we're, we'll, we'll get there. I don't want to get too ahead of myself. And also, um, Philolos did influence Copernicus himself. So pretty cool. And the absolute last thing that I want to leave off with, I, I feel like this is a bit trivial, is it's actually a quote from a fragment that I found while researching for this episode. Uh, I, I just think it's a really cool quote to bring up. There are certain thoughts which are stronger than ourselves. Yeah, that, that just kind of resonated with me. Like, when you're introduced to an idea and it goes through your head, sometimes it's just so strong, it feels beyond you. So, yeah. Um, anyways, that is all I have for the loss. Um, I actually genuinely, genuinely really enjoyed reading up on him because, um, I'm going to be honest, kind of going through Anaximander and Anaxagoras was starting to become a little bit of a bore just because of how vague the theories are. They don't, they don't really get into interesting, you know, concepts like with Pythagoreanism, you get like music somehow just relating to the universe and I don't know it was really fun to research that kind of stuff but obviously Anaxagoras and An Anaximander are very very important foundations I'm not trying to you know um really throw shade towards them like we mentioned Anaxagoras in this episode like that's an important foundation to have uh but yeah it, because that had to be done push through it but we're back to some kind of kind of fun stuff and that really ignited a um ignited the fire in me a little bit more to do some more research and talk about um sort of philosophy that relates to cosmology so yeah that is all i have for today's episode if you guys enjoyed listening to this episode and you're listening on spotify i would sincerely sincerely appreciate a follow um my spotify definitely needs a little bit more love um it has not gotten place in quite a long time so um yeah if you're listening on youtube though i still appreciate it and i would also really really enjoy if you hit that subscribe button i know um based on the last episode i will be getting a couple of new viewers i'm getting good at that youtube game getting the, my videos out into the algorithm so hopefully we'll get more viewers subscribers if you're listening please do subscribe make sure you are subscribed if you're not and yeah until next time, I will see you guys later. Peace.